Father, we just thank you so much for the ability that we have to sing praises like this to our King and our Master. I pray that you'll be with us today as we continue our worship service. In Jesus' name, amen. So take a look around. What do you have that God hasn't given you? Every heartbeat, every breath, every good and perfect gift comes from Him. He is the ultimate giver. He literally gives us gifts that we can't comprehend. Think about this. There are more electrical impulses generated in one day by a single human brain cell than by all the telephones in the world. <laughs> or how about the fact that food tastes delicious? It didn't have to taste delicious, it could have all tasted like kale. But no, it's fantastic. We plan our day around good tasting food. God gave us this. And then there's our health. We're not healthy because we deserve it. We didn't jump in a 55-gallon drum of yogurt and spinach. Our health is a gift, a gift that is too often taken for granted. God has always given to me knowing that he would get little in return. He is a father that enjoys giving good gifts to his children. I've heard it said that it's possible to give without loving, but you can never love without giving. And that is his example. For God so loved the world that he gave. Like most people, I'm often driven by what I don't have when I should be driven to seek the heart of God. Because God's heart is revealed in his generosity. Maybe my heart is too. He who comes to the secret place of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress, my God, the one I can trust. He will deliver you from Satan's snare and from the coming dreadful pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and hide you under his wings. His truth will defend and protect you. You will not be afraid of dangers lurking at night, nor of the enemy's arrows that fly by day. You will not fear plagues that stalk the night, nor disasters that strike at noon. Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6. Many times in the book of Psalms, David gives us a lot of comfort because he needed a lot of comfort himself. And he, he experienced it, and he wanted to share that with us. And he does in such wonderful ways. Today we come to the conclusion, really, of um, the mark of the beast. Um, I have to tell you that this could go on for another several weeks, but um, there is just so much information. And our church, especially the Adventist church, has studied this probably more than any other denomination. Um, most important thing for Christians every day in the world is found just after the messages of those three angels in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. These three messages are <clears throat> especially important to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why is that? When we go to verses 14 through 16, right after the three angels' message, we find out why the Adventist Church has made a special study of these three angels' uh, messages. Those verses that follow the three angels' messages are these verses. Listen. Next I saw in the distance a little white cloud. And as it came closer, it grew larger. I could see the Son of Man sitting on it. On his head he had a crown, a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. An angel came out of the sanctuary in heaven and called in a loud voice to the one sitting on the huge cloud. Swing your sickle, he said, and reap, for the time to reap has come. And the inhabitants of the earth are ready to harvest. Then the Son of Man swung his sickle over the earth as a signal to the angels to reap the earth's harvest. This is why the three angels' messages are so important, because the harvest is near. Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16. This is the picture of Jesus who sits on the cloud and he's coming to the earth to harvest people, to harvest us. <laughs> it's the end of time and Jesus is coming to take his faithful people home. Oh man, I just can't wait. 
What leads up to this great harvest? What, what leads to this harvest? It's the messages of these three angels. These angels tell the story of two groups of worshipers. There's a true group of worshipers, and there's a false group. And it probably has always been that way, at least, at least more than one false group. There's been several. But even since the time the world began, we think of Cain and Abel, perfect example of two sets of people in worshiping the same God, but in completely different ways. We have Abel, who was a true worshiper of God. He raised sheep and cattle and animals. And so God had asked both of them, Cain and Abel, to worship by offering a blood offering. It has to be a blood offering, he said, because it represents me. Jesus is saying, I am going to be sacrificed, and there's going to be blood. I want the blood offering to, to symbolize what's going to happen. Thousands of years from now, 4,000 years from that time, Jesus would be sacrificed on the cross. And so Abel gave his offering, a sheep or a goat or whatever he had that, that offered blood on the altar. Cain thought, you know, my brother raises animals and he can give part of what he's raising as an offering to God. I raise vegetables and fruits, so I should be able to give what I raise as an offering to God. God said, no, I ask for a blood offering. It symbolizes what I'm going to do 4,000 years from now. I don't know if he said those exact words, but thousands of years. Cain, the false worshiper, rose up and slew. He killed. <laughs> to, to think about it, he killed a fourth of the population. I don't know if there were other sons and daughters yet. There may have been. But those are the four that we know about, Canaan, Abel, and Adam and Eve. <laughs> he rose, rose up and killed him. And since that time, false worshipers have persecuted the true worshipers of God. All through the Old Testament, it's happened. If we look at Revelation 12, we find that Satan has always tried to do away with Jesus and those that follow Jesus. Uh, Revelation 12 tells a story in symbols. It says, the great dragon called the devil and Satan, that's that ancient serpent who is leading the whole world astray, was thrown out of heaven and came down to this earth with his angels. We learned that last week. We, we've learned it time and time again. We know that Satan did not give up his cause to be seated on the throne above the stars of God. He said it himself. He said, I want to raise my throne above the stars of God. I want to be greater than great. I want to be greater than God. <laughs> so who does he pick on next? in this story. We go to Revelation 12, verse 13, where John writes, when Satan saw that God had been vindicated, he pursued the woman. Who was the woman? Church. The church. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Who's the male child? Well, it's Jesus. God helped the woman by giving her two large wings, which she used to fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness. Where is the wilderness? The wilderness is on the earth. You don't find wilderness in the sea or in the ocean. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because the earth, there's an earth beast and there's a sea beast. The earth beast saved the woman, the church. I want you to grasp that because it comes to, to play a very important part later on. Prepared for her in the wilderness to escape the wrath of the dragon. Um, we have already discovered that the woman is the church and the male child is Jesus. 
We know also that Satan continued this pursuit after Jesus had gone back to heaven. He'd, he'd, he'd won the victory, not just for himself, but for all of us. He won the victory. We know that there were groups of people who stayed faithful to the gospel and had to hide in caves. And last week we talked about the catacombs underneath the ground. They dug out the, the soil underneath the ground and they had huge, even cities back there underneath the ground. And I mentioned that they even dug holes in the walls of these to bury their dead. They lived underneath the ground. They worshiped God in secret underneath the ground. That's part of the wilderness to which the woman, the church escaped persecution. Another definition for the word wilderness is the United States of America. <laughs> uh, there's no wilderness in the seas or the waters. Wilderness is only on the earth. When we refer to the earth, remember the land beast, and there's a sea beast. The land beast means it is sparsely populated area. Sea means it's highly populated. The earth is uh, very sparsely populated. <clears throat> so, not very many people. So in the United States at this time in prophecy, that helps to save the woman or the church because people came from Europe and all over Asia to uh, come here for religious freedom. Uh, so now we come to the angels of Revelation. We have two groups of people who worship in different ways, but they're worshiping the same God, they think. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, we will see that false worshipers will still be, and they still are today, persecuting God's people, the true worshipers. What a sad state of affairs. The strange thing is that those who kill and persecute, <laughs> who persecute the true worshipers will believe that they are doing the right thing. They believe that God commands them to persecute the people who don't worship like they do. Look at Saul to Paul. Saul commanded the death of good Christian people, and then his life was turned around. Praise God. Praise God. He turned his life around. Notice a contrast between these two groups of people. If we read verse 12 of Revelation 14. We find one group. Here's a description of them. It says, These things I saw call for special endurance on the part of God's people who keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. That's one group. This is God's people. This is the true worshipers. Uh, the picture of God's people. Now, if we look at verses 9 and 10, we find the opposite group. The opposite group. And uh, John says, <clears throat> I noticed a third angel flying behind the first and second ones, and he also gave his message in a loud voice for all to hear, saying, those who worship the sea beast. Did we find out who the sea beast is yet? Anybody? It's, it's papal Rome. Papal Rome rose up in a large populated area in Europe, in Asia, and uh, Middle East. Uh, the sea beast is, is uh, Papal Rome. The land beast is the United States, or uh, land where the, the persecuted went to find freedom. Those who worship the sea beast and its image and agree to receive his mark, the mark of its name on his forehead or in his hand, will have to drink the wine of God's judgment which will be poured out unmixed with mercy from the cup of his indignation. Um, it sounds like something we don't want. Uh, if I go through all the Ten Commandments, we know that almost every one is kept by most Christians. Almost. We have no trouble, most Christians, with commandments one through three. 
They have to do with worshiping God, not taking God's name in vain, and not building little images to bow down to and worship or pray to. We have no problem with 5 through 10. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't covet. Most Christians have no... Those are kind of self-explanatory. We don't mess with those. (laughs) Uh, The only one that has tossed the Christian world into a state of confusion and I use that word purposely, confusion, it is the very one that God said was a sign between he and his people. It's the same sign that he said for us to remember. I mentioned that time and time again. I wonder if the devil pounced on this word remember and thought, I'm going to make people forget just because I'm mad at God and I don't want him to be worshipped anymore on the day that he said to remember. Forget that. Uh, I wonder if he pounced on that. Or I also wonder if Satan was so jealous of God's position as the highest position in the universe, since this commandment identifies God as the creator, the the all-powerful God of creation, the very position that Satan coveted. Most importantly, remember to keep the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath holy. It is a sign between you and me for all time to show that you are the people whom I have chosen and set apart. Exodus 31, 13. God first set apart the Jewish nation. We, We all remember that. Set apart the Israelites. God has set apart us from the confusion going on in the, in the Protestant world today. Uh, he has set apart the Christians as his spiritual Israel today. You and I as Christians are spiritual Israel. God has set us apart from the confusion around the Sabbath day thing, <laughs> the Sabbath commandment. Uh, from the Protestant churches out there who are not really fully Protestant at all. As a matter of fact, (laughs) as a matter of fact, I call them Catholic light. Catholic light because they worship the day that the Catholics set up as, you know, as the day to worship Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. But they don't keep all the other things that the papacy, um, you know, uh, proclaims. The rules and the laws and the things that they've set up. Uh, The first day of the week is the only thing that they keep. Which, for the life of me, it was the one that God told us to remember. It's the one that identifies who God is. It's the one that uh, celebrates the creation of the world. Uh, that means the sea beast in Revelation, which is the papal church of Rome, worked throughout the Dark Ages from around 500 A.D. to around 1800, remember, 1798. Uh, they worked all those years to foist, to foist Sunday worship upon the world, upon everybody. <laughs> uh, Worship on people who could not read the Bible. And they couldn't read the Bible for several reasons. You remember these, probably. For one, it was written in Latin. Most of the people were not educated in Latin. They did not know what the Bible said. Secondly, the Bible was very expensive. They didn't have the printing press yet until around 13, 1400s. And also, the Bible, the only Bible in town, was chained to the pulpit in the church. And so, the priest or the father or whoever was preaching that day had this Bible, and he could say whatever he wanted the Bible to say. 
And all through those dark ages, 500 to 1800, the priest had free reign over people's conscience. They could say whatever they wanted to say. That's where all of these uh, weird, weird things came in. You, you've heard of purgatory. You've heard of limbo, probably. The, the, the priest spoon-fed pagan ideas into people's minds. They couldn't defend themselves because they didn't know. They didn't have a Bible. It also means the devil had these uh, thousands of years, hundreds of years to to do whatever he wanted to with people. And the priest or the papacy was his instrument, his instrument here on earth. But now let's listen to the three angels' message, these three special angels in Revelation 14. We begin with verse 6, and we visit the first angel who has a message for God's people today. The apostle John writes, Fear God and give glory to him, For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This identifies who God is. And it identifies who God is just like the fourth commandment does. It's, as a matter of fact, using the same language as the fourth commandment. It says, Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. We know what John meant when he said, fear God. It didn't mean to tremble. To fear God and tremble, it didn't mean to be afraid of God. God doesn't want us to be afraid of him. He was not talking about trembling in our shoes. Look at Ecclesiastes as as an example. It says, let us hear the conclusion of of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Um, The Clear Word Bible says it like this. Clear Word Bible is more wordy because it explains some of these uh, words better, I think. After all is said and done, there's only one thing that really matters. Reverence your heavenly father. It didn't say fear your heavenly father. Reverence your heavenly father and do what he says. That's the only thing that has meaning and lasts. So love God and keep his commandments. He loves you and has told you all you need to know. If we are giving glory to God, we're not fearing him, are we? If I'm honoring God and praising him with the wonderful music that we have, I'm not fearing him. Uh, Now we need to notice something very important about the message from this first angel. The angel is pleading for the human race to worship God in the way God intended. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the language. It says to worship the God, uh, uh, the scene changed back to the final events on earth, and I saw an angel flying high in the air, proclaiming one last time the eternal gospel to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He called out in a loud voice for all to hear, all to hear, saying, honor God and glorify his name, for the time has come for his judgment to begin. Worship him who created the heavens the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Um, it says to worship God who did something very noteworthy. He created everything. Heaven and everything that's in it. The earth and everything that's on it. The seas and the springs of water. Those words are taken right out of the fourth commandment, the commandment about the Sabbath day. Fourth commandment from Clear Word Bible says, Remember and observe the Sabbath day because I have set it apart as holy. There are six days in the week for you to earn a living, but the seventh day of the week belongs to the Lord your God. On that day you are to do no work. You, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals or any aliens living among among you. That, that phrase right there, any aliens living among you, there were a lot of people living amongst the, the Israelites. So what, that, what that's talking about is it's also for the people that are outside here. 
It's, also, it's for everyone. It was, it was created for man. Uh, because in six days, I, the Lord your God, created the earth, the sky, the seas, and everything in them. And on the seventh day, I rested in the joy of having made it all. Now listen to this. That's why I blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy so you can rest and rejoice with me. I like the way that's said. So you can rest and rejoice with me. We're rejoicing with God right now. <laughs> from, the new, or from the King James Version, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor the daughter, manservant, maidservant, nor the cattle, nor any stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Uh, every day, you and I, every day, we're glorifying one God or the other. We're glorifying one God or the other. We have one of two masters. We don't have a choice. We're either obeying one master or the other. The second angel reads like this. I saw another angel fly behind the first one, and he too gave his message in a loud voice for all to hear, saying, Babylon, confusion. There is a falling away from truth because the sea beast is working to make every nation drink the intoxication, intoxicating wine of its spiritual adulteries. Revelation 14.8. Uh, last week, we learned that Babylon is interpreted confusion. Why? Because Babylon was built in the area around the Tower of Babel, or Babel, however you want to say that. <laughs> Maybe you've heard somebody say, what are you babbling about? Uh, that means it's confusing. I can't tell what you're saying. Uh, and so uh, the Tower of Babel or Babel, however you want to say, I always say Babel. The Tower of Babel was around the area of Babylon. And so Babylon, the word Babylon or Babel means confusion. It just means confusion. Uh, these people, their language, they were trying to build this Tower of Babel because uh, there had been a flood, and they didn't want to suffer anymore in a flood, so they were building this tower. You remember the story. And God confused their languages. God confused their languages, and that's where the word confusion comes in to the Tower of Babel. God confused the language of the workers so they could not communicate with each other. So the tower was never finished because God did not want it finished. Why? Well, because he had promised and he verified that promise. He solidified that promise in a rainbow. He said, I'm not going to flood the earth anymore. Never again will the flood destroy all of humanity. And I put my bow in the sky to, to dedicate that promise to you. Well, these men didn't believe it. They didn't believe God. It was a slap in the face to God. So he confused their language. And uh, they, it, it was confusion since they accept uh, you know, all kinds of different weird things. They didn't want to believe God. The third angel has a dire warning. I noticed the third angel flying behind the first and second ones. And he also gave his message in a loud voice for all to hear, saying, those who worship the sea beast and its image and agree to receive the mark of its name on its forehead or in his hand will have to drink the wine of God's judgment, which will be poured out unmixed with mercy from the cup of his indignation. I don't know about you, um, but I sense that anything in our country can happen. Just, just any, I mean, it is getting so weird out there, folks. It's getting so weird that we can't even define what a woman is. We can't define the difference between a man and a woman. We're offering little babies, little babies that have no defense on the altar of abortion. Just like, I mean, in the Old Testament, these, these people sacrifice their babies to, to a, a god, Moloch, or a whoever, whatever god, and it's like that 
today with these people offering their little babies. When I was, uh, when I was young, <clears throat> my father uh, s- sometimes could be pretty hard. And I remember the times that I feared him was the times that I didn't obey him. He made the rules. We were taught to follow those rules, and if we broke those rules, we were afraid. And it's like that with our relationship with God. When we break his rules, we should be afraid. Now, if we keep the commandments, (laughs) there's nothing to be afraid of. We don't have to fear and tremble. I remember uh, I was just a young kid. I don't maybe 12 or 13. I wanted to go to this movie. It was the scariest movie I have ever seen in my life. It was called House on Haunted Hill. Must have been some kind of a Halloween time of year or something. I don't know. But... <clears throat> We didn't have a movie theater in my town. So I had to walk across the bridge of the Mississippi River. It's a mile wide there. I had to walk across this bridge and go to this little place in Iowa called Keokuk, Iowa, named after Chief Keokuk. He was an Indian. Uh, Anyway, I had to go there. It cost a quarter to go to the movie. So I paid my quarter, went to this movie, scared the daylights out of me. And then I had to walk back home (laughs) across this bridge a mile in pitch black dark on a sidewalk made out of wood. And you could look down through the cracks and see the river 50 feet down there. And sometimes there was a board missing and I could hear creaks and 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 squeaks on this bridge and behind every pillar there was somebody ready to grab me. God doesn't want us to be afraid. God has given us assurance when we are placed in his hands, when we obey him. uh, We have nothing to be afraid of. Has anyone received the mark of the beast yet? I read these words from Evangelism, page 234 and 235. No one has yet received the mark of the beast. The testing time has not yet come. There are two Christians in every church. I want to reread that. There are true Christians in every church. That's the call to come out of Babylon. Babylon. Confusion. Those churches are in confusion when it comes to worshiping God the way he wants them to on the Sabbath day. There are true Christians in every church not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. Even includes the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have had the light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Evangelism, 234 and 5. Psalm 46 is a wonderful promise that God protects his people. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the depths of the sea. God is there to protect us, to take care of us. We just need to obey him, and then we have nothing to fear. In the dark of the midnight, I have oft hid my face. While the storm howls above me And there's no hiding place Mid the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear me cry Keep me safe Till the storm passes by 
Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever From the sky Hold me fast, let me stand In the hollow of your hand Keep me safe Till the storm passes by Many times Satan's whispered There is no need to try For there's no end of sorrow And there's no hope by and by But I know Thou art with me And tomorrow I will rise Where the storm Never darkens the sky Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever From the sky Oh, hold me fast and let me stand in the hollow of your hand Keep me safe Till the storm passes by And when that long night is ended And the storms, they come no more Let me stand in thy presence And thy bright and peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes Lord may I dwell with thee When the storm passes by Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever from the sky Hold me fast and let me stand In the hollow of your hand And keep me safe till the storm passes by Keep me safe Till the storm passes by